just a show of hands, how many of us here have ever procrastinated in our lives? That's not right. Everyone's hands should be up right now because I damn well know we've all at least procrastinated once. I mean, I have procrastinated myself. I even procrastinated doing this TEDx talk, which is quite ironic since my TEDx talk is about how to stop procrastinating. Anyways, procrastination most of the time ends in regret. We end up regretting things that could have potentially changed our life just because we were too scared, too lazy, or we thought we had all the time in the world to do it some other day. We've all had that attitude where we go like, oh yeah, the assignment's due in a week, so I'll start it in like six days. Or I'll start going to the gym in March, and once March comes, you're like, nah, I'll do it in April. And yeah. So at some point in our life, we won't be able to continue procrastinating those things anymore. And that could be because your assignment has reached a deadline, or maybe you get into accident and you can't go to the gym anymore. None of us know how long we have left to live. Some of us can live up to 100 years, while others won't even make it to 20. Worldwide, the average life expectancy of a human is 71.5 years. And that's not the same for every country. In this data from the World Health Organization, Japan has the highest life expectancy of at least 84 years. And Australia just follows by after with a year below that. While most African countries have a life expectancy of just below 60 years. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how much more time privilege we have than many other countries in the world? And yet, most of us still take our time for granted. I have to admit, I myself have wasted a lot of time as well. But after coming across this discovery, I really wanted to find a way to make my time more productive. And so I thought about it. How was I going to go from doing nothing to doing something? And that's when it hit me. Your perception. Procra procrastination is just a psychological deception set up by the mind to prevent people from doing things that could benefit them later in life. And in order to escape that deception, you have to find a way to alter your um, perspective. For me, however, I first had to figure out a way, um, the reason behind why I had such a pessimistic attitude. And so I was wandering around, thinking about it, and remembering all my breakups and breakdowns and all my other personal problems. And I realized that my mental health had reached quite a dreadful state. And I needed to find what type of problem I was having. And so I was scrolling through the internet, right? And I, met, um, I came across this American research professor. Her name is Brene Brown. She conducted a research based on the subject of connection. And when she asked people about the word connection, they tend to talk about their experiences of disconnection. When asked about love, they talked about heartbreaks. And when asked about belonging, they told stories about the times where they felt excruciating seclusion. Six weeks into this research, she um, discovered that there was something common in between all these people. And that one common thing was shame. Everyone felt like they were not good enough and they didn't value themselves as, something, as someone worth something. And I guess that was what I was going through as well. I, was, um, I felt inadequate in a way that I didn't feel like I was good enough for, um, for anyone at all. And that's when I realized what I needed to change. I, um, in order to change my perception, I had to learn to love myself. And it was quite difficult. It took me a while. I was trying to find different ways to change my mindset up a bit. And throughout that time, I always remember this quote by Mark Twain. Um, and it has stuck in my head every time. And it has motivated me wherever I go. 
And it goes like this. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the ones you did do. So throw off the bowlins, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sail, explore, dream, discover. And so that's what I did. I took an 11-day voyage on the Young Endeavor. <laughs> and I sailed from away from Sydney Harbor, past Jervis Bay, into Bass Strait, and visited the islands of Tasmania, and then sailed back to Melbourne. And I had no experience whatsoever at all. It was a big leap out of my comfort zone. I had no friends there. They took away our phones from the beginning of the voyage. And then, um, so there was no Wi-Fi, no internet, nothing that could connect me back into the real world. I was just by myself with 10 staff members and 26 other young strangers. It was quite an adventure. Um, in the beginning of the voyage, they threw us with a lot and lots of challenges. And one of those challenges was battling seasickness. It was so much more worse than I had expected. My parents did try to warn me about it, but I was a young, cocky man who was determined to do everything by himself. And, of course, it didn't go as well as I planned. Guess who vomited nine times? <laughs> I know, nine times. And unfortunately, I didn't even get a title for the person who vomited the most on that voyage. One of my most vivid memories, when I was standing on the side of the boat with two of my other shipmates, and our bodies were 90 degrees arched on the side, and before we know it, we were vomiting in harmony. I don't know. I can't get that picture out of my head. So here's an image for you guys to have a look. That's me over there. I couldn't get an actual photo ready for you guys because I thought it was kind of weird if I took a photo of myself with two strangers vomiting on the side of the boat. So I made a PG-13 photo so that you guys could at least sympathize with my suffering. <laughs> Later on in that night, um, my group were given the gut watch, which means we had to stay up from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m., keeping an eye out in the water and setting up the sails. As I was seasick, most of the time, I was trying to fall asleep. And it was an intense mental battle for me, trying to stay up on deck and do things, despite wanting to go back down on my bunk bed and sleep. <laughs> but... Later on that night, um, we started learning how to be able to sail the boat and try to, um, to turn the wheel and try to keep the boat in the right direction. And so it was time for my group leader to choose one of us to try and turn the wheel and learn how to sail the boat for the first time. And of course, out of all people, he chose the one who was ready to pass out. Anyways, <laughs> I went on there, took the helm, and I tried to um, avoid my s thinking about my seasickness at all because I did not want to not only not disappoint my teammates, but I didn't want to disappoint myself either. And so at the moment when I successfully guided my sh um, the boat out into the right direction, an epiphany popped into my head. I realized that I was, I realized how much, uh, how strong I was physically and mentally. Because if I was capable of this, no one again could ever tell me I was unworthy. Because I'm the only person who can truly define my own value and understand how strong I can be. So what's next after that? After I had changed my perspective, I needed to do something. So I needed to take initiative. But for this one, I won't be, able to, I won't be talking about my story. I'm going to talk to you about one of my other shipmates, Inspiring Journey which really, truly defines what taking initiative is. This is Lisa. She has wanted to go on the Young Endeavor ever since March 2016. 
But unfortunately, she was rejected by her medical doctor because she had undiagnosed trigger fainting and unmanaged um, pre-diabetes. Despite being treated well after that, she got her heaviest weight to up to 133 kilograms. And the weight limit for any of the voyage was 120. And of course, that was a big setback for her. And it was a really hard pill for her to swallow. But nonetheless, throughout the year, she started caring more about her mental health and started taking baby steps into becoming a healthier person. And then through the positive support of her physiotherapists, families, and friends, her mental health improved, and then she was able to um, start regularly exercising and lost majority of her weight. She kept on persisting non-stop, despite all the challenges that kept, kept coming towards her. And by then, she was finally cleared off her trigger fainting and prediabetes, lost 37.5 kilograms, and on the 4th of January 2019, she was finally able to sail the boat she has always dreamed of sailing. So, it wasn't easy at all. She had a lot to take in. She had to take care of her mental health first, and after that, start taking initiative and taking steps to, recover, um, to becoming a better person, no matter how big or small it was. And then she kept on persisting and overcoming the challenges that kept coming in her feet. And at the end, she was rewarding with a life-changing outcome. So if I had one thing to let you guys take from this, do not live your life thinking that you have plenty amount of time to live. Rather, live it by doing the most during the time you have. Time is just a psychological barrier that has kept us living a controlled life surrounded with limitations. What really makes a life worth living is through the experience that we make for ourselves. So go out there, explore your world, chase your dream, and lead with passion. Because after doing so, you discover that the potential you have to offer is so much more than what you can imagine. Thank you.